Hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, or evening. Uh, my name is Paulius. I am the managing director of the Center for Social Norms and Behavioral Dynamics at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and welcome to another Novec talk. Thank you for joining us. Um, our agenda today will be quite similar to previous occasions. Um, I will have five minutes for a short welcome. We will then watch this week early career researcher video by Dr. Tatiana Seladin from the University of Bologna. And then we will have our main speaker for today, which is Professor Rachel Cranton from Duke University. Um, and then we will have 15 minutes for questions and answers. Um, as I always do, um, I wanted to remind you that this speaker series is organized by our center at Penn with uh, two partner programs, the PPE program and the Master of Behavioral and Decision Sciences. Um, about us, we are a research center uh, at Penn that enables organizations to enact sustainable positive behavioral change. Uh, we do mainly consulting, research, and training. You can see more information about us in our webpage. You can follow us on Twitter um, following this QR code. Um, and you're probably already aware of this, but this is our spring uh, programming. You can uh, follow this link or scan this QR code um, to see the full schedule to see the videos of our past talks, to um, be part of our shared calendar, to get the updates and so on. Uh, we are doing talks every two weeks at the same time, same link. So I hope you will join us for some of the next talks. Um, and two quick reminders of um, ways in which you can get involved with uh, the work we're doing if you're interested. We are still looking for contributors for our blog. Uh, we've had a very good response of, of proposals, but we will um, publish all over the year. So we um, have a lot of space for you to publish your work and disseminate it further um, on behavioral topics in general. And then we also have our monthly center bulletin. If you follow this link or scan this QR code, you can see the previous versions, you can subscribe to get the new versions, um, and it's based basically a monthly um, newsletter with news, publications, uh, media mentions, and, and other pieces of information from the center. Um, a few ground rules, if you've never joined the talks, uh, please remember to, to mute yourself when you're not speaking. Um, if you want, if you can, please keep your camera on so that we have a more interactive experience. Uh, for questions, you can use the chat at any time, or you can raise, use the raise hand function at the end of the, of the talk in the questions and answers um, slot. Um, and as always, we are transmitting live on Facebook and the recordings of all our talks are available in our website including this one in, in a few days. So with that, let me introduce our early career researcher um, speaker for today. Dr. Tatiana Seladin is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bologna. Um, and the talk is called Do the Right Thing for Whom? An experiment on in-group favoritism, group assorting, and moral suasion. Um, if you follow this QR code or this link, you can um, access the, the paper. Right, so let me share the video. Hi everyone, I'm Tatiana Ciladin, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bologna, and today I'm going to present this joint work with Professor Bilancini, Professor Boncinale, Professor Caprara, and my colleague Di Paolo. 
So as we know, most people are not completely selfish. Indeed, they are not only motivated by the final payoff, but they have also preferences for following their personal norms, that is, following what they personally believe to be the right thing to do in a given context. And there is evidence that making morality salient can affect um, people's behavior. So the idea is very simple. If people's behavior is driven by moral preferences, then making morality salient should impact people's behavior. And we extend this line of research by studying the effect of moral suasion in group favoritism, that is, the tendency to favor members of one own group are across to a member of another group. And this is important for two reasons. One is practical, indeed, in group favoritism is one of the most fundamental behavior among humans. And the other one is theoretical, indeed, predictions are not trivial. On one side, helping the group is a universal moral rule across many societies, and this suggests that moral suasion should increase in group favoritism. But on the other side, it is also possible that the effect of moral suasion on group favoritism depends on contextual factors such as group assertivity. And in this study, we answer the following research questions. So whether asserting based on moral preferences generates more in group of favoritism than asserting based on no moral preferences, and whether moral suasion mitigates in group of favoritism, and finally, whether moral suasion affects in group of favoritism differently when group um, asserting is based on moral preferences compared to when it is based on no moral preferences. And to do so, we run an online experiment, two times two design experiment, using the platform Proetic, where we collected the 502 subjects. And they were randomly assigned to one of these two treatments, the non-moral assorting treatment and the moral assorting treatment. In the non-moral assorting treatment, participants were asked their preferences on five non-moral issues, while in the moral assorting treatment, participants were asked their opinion on five moral issues. And according to their preferences, they were divided into groups based on similar preferences. After that, they had to play two blocks of three randomized dictator games. The first block is the baseline block, and they had to decide how to split 100 points between themselves and a member of the same group, then 100 points between themselves and a member of the other group, and finally 100 points between a participant of the same group and a member of the other group. After the baseline block, they faced the moral suasion block that is the same as the previous one. But in this case, they were told, do what you think is morally right. And starting from the dictator games, we were able to construct two measures of in-group favoritism, the costly in-group favoritism measure and the costless in-group favoritism. The first one is the difference between how much the subject gave to a member of a group and a member of the other group in the decision where the subject was involved, while the second one is the difference between 50 and how much the subject gave to a member of the other group in a decision where the subject was not involved. So now we can jump to the results, and the first question was whether assertivity based on moral preferences affects uh, more in group favoritism. And we have that the cost of in group favoritism measure is uh, higher when uh, assertivity is based on moral preferences uh, with respect to uh, when it is based on no moral preferences. Indeed, the difference is significant. And the same for the costless in group favoritism measure. The second question was whether moral suasion mitigates in group of favoritism, and we have uh, that the cost in group of favoritism measure, measure is higher under the baseline block with respect to the moral suasion block, and the difference is also significant. The same again for the costless in group of favoritism measure. So let me say that uh, even if uh, uh, moral suasion uh, decreases in group of favoritism, we cannot say that uh, moral suasion has the same effect for all the participants. Indeed, we can uh, identify three types uh, of uh, participants. We have uh, the unpersuaded, and for the unpersuaded, uh, in group of favoritism is the same under moral suasion and the baseline. Then we have the persuaded universalist, and for them, in group of favoritism decreases under moral suasion with respect to the baseline. And finally, we have the third uh, um, category that are the persuaded parochialists. And for them, in group of favoritism increases under moral suasion with respect to the baseline. So the last question was whether moral suasion affects in group of favoritism dependently on different assertivity. And in the figure, we have the difference between the moral suasion block and the baseline block. And we have that the costly in group um, favoritism 
is uh, the same under the new moral um, preferences and the moral preferences, the same for the cost listing group of favoritism. So basically moral equation is stable across the uh, group of sortativity. To conclude, uh, our main results are that participants tend to favor uh, more the, um, the member of their uh, group when uh, the group are assorted uh, according to moral preferences. Then we have that the effect of moral equation is to decrease in group of favoritism on average, but uh, there is also a non-negligible proportion of participants for whom uh, moral suasion increases the group of favoritism. And finally, we have that the effect of moral suasion is substantially stable across the group of fertility. So thank you for so much for your attention, and if you have any questions, please feel, feel free to contact me. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Tatiana, for the wonderful presentation. Um, as always, unfortunately, we don't have time for live questions uh, for this um, part. So, but I have seen Tatiana in the audience. So if you have any comments, questions, or you'd, you'd like to connect, please feel free to write in the chat. Um, I also just noticed that the QR code and the link that I had included here was wrong. Um, yeah, so probably Tatiana can, can uh, share uh, a link to her profile or, or any papers in the chat. So sorry about that. And with that, um, I can introduce our main speaker for today, Professor Rachel Granton from Duke University with the talk, Deconstructing Bias in Social Preferences. So Professor Cranton is a member of the National Academy of Sciences, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, and a fellow of the Econometric Society and of the Society for the Advancement of Economic Theory and was awarded as Cher Blaise Pascal. She has served on the Executive Committee of the American Economic Association and on the editorial boards of the American Economic Review and the Journal of Economic Literature and as a managing editor of the Economic Journal. She is currently serving as Dean of Social Sciences in Duke's Trinity College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and our moderator for today, as um, in several previous occasions, will be Dr. Oigon Demand, an Associate Professor of Practice in Behavioral and Decision Sciences here at Penn and a core member of our center. So with that, I give you the floor. Is it me that you give the floor? Yes. You, okay. Thank you. All right. So let me go ahead. I wasn't sure uh, what the time exactly is. Let me try and share my screen. Hopefully this will be successful. We did rehearse. Uh, okay. So thumbs up that you see the main slide. Yes. Okay. Well, thank you so very much for inviting me. Um, I just love your format. And Tatiana, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. And I'm looking forward to reading details. Of course, this is very related to what I'm going to be talking about today. So I'm sure that's not, a, not an accident. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about a um, really a research agenda that has um, several pieces and hopefully a future. And of course, I'm very interested to hear <laughs> what you think about the future um, directions that we could go. So what we're trying to do in this project is deconstruct the bias and social preferences, <clears throat> which we saw in Tatiana's talk, which she was also trying to do that, is to see there's, you know, we have all these experiments out there and we see that people do things on average. There's an in-group bias on average, but that average may or may not be representative of what people um, actually do. And that's uh, what actually one of our major findings is. So this is joint work with um, collaborators here at Penn. Um, I'm sorry, not at Penn, Duke. They're at, uh, they're at Duke. Um, uh, and um, very grateful to them for that, for this ongoing work. So what is our motivation? Just to step back a bit um, and just to tell you sort of how I started thinking about this project. Um, I started thinking about group conflict and I've been thinking about identity overall and identity in economics um, and inspiration for that, or I don't one could call that inspiration, is that a group conflict is a feature of human history. Um, groups are defined on religion, race, nationality, and culture. And 
in, if we want to talk about economics, these groups or the way pe when people are divided into the groups, what they actually do is forcibly extract labor and resources from other people, right? So groups play this role in our economy. And um, obviously I'm giving very extreme examples in the, in the photo, in the images on the screen. Um, but there's, this is sort of continuing even in our, um, in our world today. Um, there still remains civil wars. There still remains country and regional battles and there's alternative identities. This is an image from the US civil war, of course, uh, United States. And people would argue that a lot of the civil war was about the identity of America. And maybe there's more lighthearted rivalries out there that are, um, but still run pretty deep um, uh, uh, where people sort of divide themselves up into groups and they're fans of different, um, football teams, for example, but uh, I wouldn't want to be on the stadium on the wrong side of the stadium, if you know what I mean. Um, and about the American Civil War, it might not be over. Uh, that is an image from the South Carolina State House just a couple of years ago. So I just want to give you a sense of you know, where I'm coming from. Um, and this is trying to understand these very deep, these very deeply felt um, positions vis-a-vis -vis other people in other groups, however those other groups will be fined, and perhaps the destructiveness that can come from them. So I'm not, of course, the only one who's been trying to understand this, right, at, from both a theoretical and experimental point of view. Obviously, there's a long history um, and experimental tradition in sociology and social psychology. And we know that, you know, these, and I'm going to, you know, just briefly put some images up later where the basic finding is subjects are divided into groups, as we just saw um, in Tatiana's experiment, and that there's an in-group bias is a, is a relatively robust feature. The economics of this um, starts in with Chen, uh, Yan Chan and Sherry Lee's paper in 2009. And the distinction, of course, between an economic experiment and other experiments is that there's actual monetary incentives. And so this was the first um, experiment in economics that really attacked group bias. And what they found is that um, it, there is in-group bias on average. Um, so they looked at the average across people. And the main finding is that people are inequity averse towards others. So that means that vis-a-vis -vis somebody in their group, people were inequity averse. So they didn't like, they didn't like inequity. So they were trying to remedy an inequity towards somebody in their group. People were also trying to remedy inequities towards people outside their group. It's just not as intensely so, right? So people are inequity averse, just not as intensely inequity averse towards people outside of their group. So this kind of was a puzzle to me um, because that didn't, doesn't match every those images I had on the previous slide about the forcible extraction of labor and resources from people in another group, right? So that is not all, that's not about inequity aversion. That's actually inequity loving. It's trying to, you know, you're, you're really trying to take things away from other people. So that's sort of the jumping off, off point is trying to see, well, look, I, I mean, Chen and Lee's oh, it's an amazing experiment. All these experiments are really well done. Um, I, I learn a lot from them. So but, but what is it that we're not able to see when we are focusing on the average behavior? So the, hence the word deconstructing the bias. So there's a bias out there, but let's deconstruct it and see what's behind it. And if, if that's a useful exercise. So this, the research agenda is about looking behind the average. Do we see group bias or and destructive behavior? And if we do, what, are, what pushes it around? Are certain, you know, does it depend on um, how strongly people identify with a particular group to which they've been defined? Maybe, we'll find out. Uh, the answer turns out to possibly be no. But, um, and what decreases the bias? If there are some people that have this particularly strong um, predilection towards destructive behavior, for example, or bias against the out group, what can we do about it? Okay, so um, what I'm gonna to present today is findings from three different studies where there's group manipulation. These are all income allocation experiments. They're gonna be a bit different than what Tatiana presented. So what I'll show you exactly what they are, but they are income allocation experiments. Um, and the first one study asked, does stronger identification with the group relate to bias? So the idea is, well, maybe 
the people out there that are really engaged in this biased behavior, they're the ones that are more, you know, really identify with the group to which they've been assigned or to which, uh, you know, they are in the society. And the answer seems to be no. Um, I'm not going to say no ever, ever, but no in the context of the experiments. But rather what we see is something quite interesting, which is that some people readily react to the, the group divisions and some people don't at all, not at all, right? So a, a quite a large number of people don't react to being putting put in these groups into these um, into groups. So we're we're so therefore the average of in-group bias may not be representative of any individual behavior, any individual's behavior, because there's some people who have no bias whatsoever. And there's some people that have extreme bias. Now, on average, that creates this, this inequity version that I mentioned before, but it doesn't may not be representative of a large set of our of people. So this is what I was just saying. Some people have no in-group bias, some people have very strong in-group bias. In fact, they are, I did find this destructive behavior. And of course, when we average it out, we see this inequity aversion. Um, so what we're trying to understand here is that there may be some people out there that have more of a tendency to react to being put into groups than other people. And that may be an individual trait. And so we're trying to explore that um, further and further in this research. Um, part of this agenda was to say, well, if that's true, are there any demographic correlates to this? You know, if it is true that some people have this tendency, who are they? So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the remedy, if there is a remedy, um, what if there are people out there who have this uh, tendency, how would we perhaps address that if we think they're acting in um, harmful ways towards others? And we look at providing what we call humanizing information. So something idio some idiosyncratic information about somebody, for example, they wanted to be a fire uh, fighter when they grew up. Uh, so, I mean, that's what they said when they were little. And yes, indeed, we do see a diminution of the, uh, of the, of the bias. Okay, so let me jump into the um, background and to the experiments themselves. All right, um, so just to make sure I'm keeping with time, I have until two and then that's when the Q&A starts. Is that right? Okay, yeah, great, I'm saying nod. Okay, so just so that we're all on the same page. And I also think it's important, though I'm not gonna go on and on about it now, I also think it's very important that we're clear on who our um, participants in our experiments are, because that might also matter. So, so going back to the social psychology uh, tradition, uh, some of the first experiments on group uh, behavior or this bias in group behavior, as I'm sure you know, was the Sharif and Sharif Roberts K experiment around 1954. Uh, this is a picture um, from the group of uh, young, you can see that they're, they're about 10 year old, 12 year old uh, boys that were taken um, to a state park in Oklahoma, hence Roberts Caves State Park. And the finding is that the, you know, these, as you know, the kids were put into um, uh, different groups. They didn't know about it. They sort of knew that there was this another group out there and then they were brought together to do all sorts of camp games and uh, you know, swimming, archery and so on. And the finding from that is that competition creates groups and this incredible animosity. I mean, these kids were calling each other names and doing all sorts of saying all sorts of nasty things about each other. So that's um, where we get this idea that competition creates groups. Now, the opposite end of the spectrum is well, you don't have to bring kids out into a state park to see this in-group bias. You can do something very minimal, hence the minimal groups experiments, where, um, as you know, uh, again, but again, same age kids and boys were brought into the lab um, and asked to um, choose among matrices of payoffs for themselves and for, sorry, not for themselves, actually, between somebody else in their group and somebody else in another group. Um, so their own payoffs were not involved. And these experiments also largely generate this in-group bias, again, on average. Now, Chen and Lee, uh, fast forwarding, they essentially are adopting the, the um, Tadgeville and Turner method of doing a minimal group, and they have um, allocations of income, but now their own income is at stake. So that's the transformation. So participants are allocating money between themselves and an in-group participant and themselves, 
and an outgroup participant. And they're so, again, the individual's own money is at stake and being economists, they're going to they, um, estimate what we, they call social preferences or what's called in the larger economics literature, something called social preferences. Social preferences is how much an individual cares about the income of somebody else or the payoffs of somebody else. So they estimate a utility function, that's the utility function that's estimated. And the finding, as I mentioned earlier, is that um, participants are inequality averse. They don't like inequality. And, and, and they're willing to pay, right, out of their own income in order to reduce inequality. It's just they do more, they're more inequality averse for in-group than out-group. But, but towards out-group people, they are inequality averse on average. So this is the jumping off point for what um, I've done with my co-authors. So to give you a sense of that, um, of that work, we also um, are looking at social preferences. And now we have two conditions. We have a minimal group condition and a political group condition. And our objective here is to see if intensity um, of, of identification with one of the groups matters for individual behavior. So this is where we're starting this deconstructive, um, the deconstructing um, effort here. So that's our original objective is do individuals as individuals more or less identify with the sign group and then can we see that that matters for their behavior? And so the first thing I should say is we actually, exactly, I mean, it's beautiful replication of the Chen and Lee results. We see exactly what they see um, when we estimate the in-group bias on average, but we do find a huge amount of heterogeneity, which I talked to you about earlier, which leading us to this, this sort of um, understanding or proposition that there's groupy and not groupy people. Um, in our populations. So uh, the details. So first, this is our study population. Uh, that's what Duke looks like on a sunny day. It's kind of cold here now, but uh, it's warm most of the year. And that's really what it looks like. And those, speaking of identity, are the students at a basketball game, except they're wearing masks now. But um, so it's a very spirited place. And again, I always think it's important to understand exactly who our subjects are. And that, of course, can be um, one of the things you'll be seeing later is, is sort of demographics and where people live. So this is a university campus population. Um, all right. So here's the schematic of the um, experimental session. The first thing is that the, the participants received instructions. Then the first thing that they did was um, an asocial control. And I'll show you exactly the task in a minute where here subjects were not divided into groups at all. They were just said, here's somebody else, allocate money to them. Then there was the minimal group treatment or the political group treatment. And again, uh, the minimal group treatment divided subjects um, into groups based on the Clay and Kandinsky as well as some other, uh, other aesthetic questions, or they were divided into groups by their answers to a questionnaire about their political leanings. So the minimal group treatment came first or the political group treatment came first. So this was randomized. And then there was a post-experiment survey. And the subjects were paid for um, a choice in each one of these um, phases. So it's a, okay, you're obviously noticing right now that this is a within subject experiment. So we're gonna be able to see the same person in all three settings, which is really key. A little bit of a, um, detail on the political group treatment. Participants first self-identified as Democrat, Republican, independent, or none of the above. If they said they were independent or none of the above, then we put them, um, then we asked a further question, are you closer to Democrats or closer to Republicans? The two groups then consist of the Democrats, the people who say they were Democrats are put in the Democrat group. They also consist, the Democrat group, also consists of the people who said they were independent or none of the above, but are closer to the Democrats. And so we put them in the Democrat group as well. We call those democratic leaning independents, similar for the Republican groups. In the end, this is our, our population is overwhelming. Well, 75% of our subject pool are Democrats or democratic leaning. So in the end, that is the, the part of our subject pool, which we end up um, focusing on because we don't have a lot of power for the um, other group. Um, but what are we trying to you know, understand is, is there a difference in behavior between the Democrats and the Democratic-leaning independents 
They've both been placed in the Democrat group. And we tell them that you're placed in a group. You're in the Democrat group. But the Democrats, the people who say they're Democrats, are different than the people who don't say they're Democrats, but say they're closer to being a Democrat. Okay, So that was where we were getting our experimental variation in that some people who are in this group arguably feel more attached to that group. I should say there's absolutely no difference in their political positions. So we've tested that. There's no difference in the, in the political positions between these two sets of people. Just this set of people said that they're Democrats and these set of people said they're not, but we put them in the group anyway. They just said they were closer to being Democrats than Republicans. Okay. R Rachel, a quick question about um, the design here. Um, so one of the challenges obviously comes from people having different perceptions of what it means to identify as a Democrat or Democrat leaning. Um, but if we take um, evaluations like the inclusion of other in the self scale, the IOS scale that psychologists use, right? Even that is not clear that people evaluate, you know, from one to seven, everybody evaluates it in the same way. So are you concerned that maybe if you were to standardize it in some form that, you know, some people who say that democratic leaning are technically would be considered Democrats or vice versa. Like, how can you identify that this variation is actually comparable across these different subgroups? Across these different, what was the last Subgroups, one? like subgroups. Yeah, right? so, yeah. so you're, it's a fantastic question. And the answer is, I don't know. I can only go according to what I've actually asked people, right? And I did not ask them that scale. We, we you know, and, and I think that's, Part of the future research is actually we want to see whether what we've done uh, actually uh, is going to that scale might be a useful measure of um, what we're going to call groupiness. So I think it's a fantastic question. And of course, we know this is all subjective, right? And even what people mean when they look at these little circles. So I can't just say anything beyond what people have told me. I can tell you we did ask them about six or seven political positions. I forget which ones. They're absolutely identical on political positions. If, for example, our democratic leaning independents were, you know, did not hold the same political positions, but they sort of just lean that direction, then I'm obviously really mixing apples and oranges in terms of political positions. I don't know intensity of political positions, right? I mean, I, I didn't ask how intensely are you in favor of, you know, you know government redistribution? So, so it's a great question. And I, I think that we should all be a bit... Um, humble, you know, when we interpret our data, right? Yeah, I think political you know, scientists have developed like a method that you can probably use, uh, right? They yeah, it would be great. About, yeah, they have these questions about um, how opposed are you to your daughter marrying uh, a Oh, yeah, so there's, Democrat so we, or, you know, we, we're, like we're trying that on a different scale. So, yeah, so we're trying something like that in a different set of experiments, which is sort of how you feel about somebody else from somebody's group. And, and it's a, sort of a Likert scale and starts out from something really mild, you know. Would you have coffee with this person up to, you know, how do you feel about somebody in your family marrying this person, right? So exactly. Now it turns out that in our experiment, uh, it turns out that, that our hypothesis was wrong altogether. <laughs> so so in, end, in the end, the question is kind of moot for this study, but I think it's a really important general question. So, okay. All right, so uh, I wanna give you a sense of the task. Uh, so the task, uh, how would we be able to get so much data uh, in, you know, 45 minutes or, you know, because, because we ask people to make this decision many, many, many times. So you may have seen that we've got a lot of observations per individual, which is what allows us to be confident in that I've identified an individual type, which I'll talk about in a minute. So this is, again, it's a within subject experiment. We have a lot of data on each individual and individual choices. Um, so they were presented matrices that look like this. Um, this is, a, you might recognize it as a sort of uh, neuro, neuro imaging setup, right? Everything could be done with fingers. Um, we have in mind at one point to be doing neuro imaging. 26 matrices of these sites, so 208 decisions per subject. And the subject is just asked to choose between the top row and the bottom row. And if the subject, for example, were to choose a uh, the bottom row here, the subject would be giving up 20 and increasing equity. So this would be evidence of inequity aversion, right? The subject gives up 20 in order to achieve equity. Um, everything is randomized that you can imagine. The top row, the bottom row, the green, the left, right? Everything's randomized. We don't have a green effect, a right effect, a blue effect, or any other effect like that. Okay, so that particular um, choice, oh, sorry, I sort of said that this is money for the subject. 
and this is money for the other person. And in the group treatments, um, I, I don't have it on the next slide, I should have, um, it's either says you other or it says you own. This would have be saying own if it were the person in your own group. I wanted to show you this as an example because here when the person goes from 140 to 120, they're giving up 20 to make the other person go down by 80. Okay, so this is a welfare destructing choice, right? And this is the type of choice that I was curious about is to say, is this out there? And when do we see it? Now, other uh, folks have seen this kind of behavior. Some it's called spite in some other literature, you know, in, in you know, every, there's different words for that. I'm using dominant seeking. So you, the person's giving up 20 to make the other person go down by 80. And it's increasing um, inequality. All right, so what are the basic results? So um, I'm going to um, consider individual favoritism in allocating income. So how do we construct this measure? You take an individual I in some condition G and for a given matrix, sorry, in condition G, and then for a given matrix M, which is covered up by uh, other parts of what's on my screen here, the, the zoom thing, we're going to look at the person. Uh, so here's a person, he's, this is exactly the same matrix. They see this matrix twice. They see it when they're allocating money to somebody in their own group, and they see it when they're allocating money to somebody in the other group. And suppose when for their own group, they're picking the top line. So that's the per other person gets 100. And when somebody in the other group, they pick the bottom line. So the other person is getting 20. So that's 100 minus 20 is 80, right? That's the favoritism that they are showing for their own group. You average across all 26 matrices, and that will give a favoritism for individual I. So we have two numbers for each person, their favoritism in the minimal group treatment and the favoritism in the political group treatment. So let's take a look at the favoritism in the, um, towards the in-group and the political group treatment. So again, remember, this is where we divided people into the groups according to whether they were Democrats or Republicans or whether they leaned Democrat or leaned, uh, leaned Republican. Um, let's just take a look at, um, we're comparing Democrats to Democratic leaning independents, which was our hypothesis. We would think, and actually look, it looks really cool, right? The Democrats do seem to have higher in-group favoritism than Democratic leaning independents. This is a, these are box and whisker plots of that um, favoritism measure. So there's 140-ish, 144, I believe, um, subjects. We've got 144 data points, and this is the box and whisker plots, right? And we see, look, this is the mean. Mean favoritism is higher, uh, in-group phase is higher for the Democrats than it is for the people who are independents, but in that, in that setting, in that group. So, okay, so that looks like, wow, we're right or you know, our hypothesis is correct, except it's not. Because when we look at the minimal group treatment, right, we see exactly the same pattern. The Democrats, I've got to move, I've got to be able to see, I've got to move this down here. There we go, that's better. Um, the Democrats here also show more in-group favoritism than the Democratic leaning independents, but this is the minimal group treatment. It has nothing to do with politics here, right? So we see a set of people that are acting in a more biased way, right? It have this in-group bias, right? Then another set of people, where's my cursor? Then another set of people, but in a setting that is one of these arbitrary minimal group settings. Okay, so when we actually, whoops, when we look at the difference, now I got it, and we, we see that it's significant, right? I can't, where, am I, where am I? Okay. But when we look at the difference is in the differences, there is nothing. Right, which is saying that what ha what's happening is the political group treatment is just elevating everybody's in-group bias, but it's not changing the difference between those who are more attached to the group versus less attached to the group. So this is, again, it's kind of puzzling what's going on here. And again, we're finding pretty clearly that attachment to the group is not what's driving the in-group bias. So what is? So the next question is, look, maybe are these people here who have a very high in-group bias in the political group treatment, are they the same people that have a very high bias in the minimal group treatment? And the answer is yes, okay? So we take a look at that. So now remember we have two, two data points on each person. 
And so now we've plotted them. Uh, the favoritism in the minimal group, favoritism in the political group, what we see here is the 45 degree line. The correlation is 0.63 and a linear regression gives us an R squared of 0.4. So here's where we're getting the beginnings of our idea that there are some people who are simply what we're calling not groupy. They show no favoritism. They say no favoritism in the political minimal group and they show no favoritism in the pol political group, right? Now I'm not saying that these people are necessarily wonderful people, right? They are, in fact, we're gonna see that a lot of them act just selfishly all the time. They just take money for themselves and they take money for themselves all the time, right? Some of these people are inequity averse, but they're inequity averse all the time towards in the political, you know, towards whomever they're talking, you know, somebody in their group, somebody out of the group. These people are just simply not reactive to the group setting. On the other hand, these people are very reactive to being placed into groups, right? So these people are changing their behavior possibly depending on, on whether somebody's in their group and, and out of their group, they're changing their um, choices. So uh, this is just looking at this raw data of, um, how am I doing on time? Okay, this is looking at the raw data of this favoritism. And then we are going to do what we do, which is we're going to estimate social preferences. So in order to estimate social preferences, you have to posit a utility function. So this way we, we just borrow from the literature if we normalize the matrix so the top row gives more weekly more to I, then if I chooses the bottom row, I is choosing the bottom row for some sort of reason that's reducing their own payoffs. It could be they don't, in which case they're just being selfish. They're just grabbing money for themselves or taking the money for themselves and they're not concerned with any social objective. If they choose the bottom row, it could be because they're inequity averse. So they're again, giving up money of those themselves, their own money, so that somebody, um, so that the outcome is more equal. It could be that they're trying to maximize overall payoffs, so they give up money for themselves so that the overall pie goes up. It could be that they um, give up money for themselves in order to make the relative difference between themselves and somebody else higher. So that would be dominant seeking. So this is the utility function that we estimate. Um, it's the standard one out there in the literature. You have your weight on your own income and you have weight on income differences. And um, the estimation basically gives you the signs of these parameters. Then once you have the signs of these utility function parameters, you can then reinterpret them in the language that I just had. And so let me, so inequity aversion is what um, I said that Chen and Lee found. Um, so we, ours is just a sort of a modified version of Chen and Lee. It's just written in a different way. And if rho is negative, that's this one. And if sigma is negative, that's that parameter. That means the person doesn't like inequality. And indeed, on average, uh, you see people are inequity averse. Again, on average, Chen and Lee found that uh, people are inequity averse uh, more so for people that are in their group less so for people that are outside of their group, but they're still inequity averse, okay? In order to get at individuals, we, um, oh, okay, this is what I was just saying. Okay, sorry. So we, as we do this estimation exercise, and the first thing we do is replicate Chen and Lee, okay? And we find exactly what they found. In order to get at individual social preferences, we use something called a mixing model where we estimate these uh, utility function parameters for a given number of types. And we picked possibly four types. And what the data does, so what this estimation does, it gives the, per, the utility function parameters of these types and the percentage of the population of each type. Now, to be very clear, we don't tell the model, I want, you know, I want people to be inequity averse versus dominant seeking versus selfish. It's the utility function parameters that are estimated, which then tells me whether they are uh, inequity of selfish or dominant seeking. And so it's the data which gives the parameters of each of the types and the percentage of the population of each type. Then once we have those types, we're not done yet because now we've got to put each individual as a type. So we look at um, individuals and their own behavior and we see for which, for which type is their behavior the best match? And it turns out that those type categorizations are extraordinarily tight in the sense that we could say with 95% confidence, this person has the utility function parameters of a selfish person, you know, as we've estimated them, okay? 
And almost everybody is, um, is allocated to a utility function type um, with, that, with that kind of precision. So then finally, we get to the punchline is we want to identify groupy versus non-groupy individuals. So non-groupy individuals have the same utility type when they are dealing with somebody who's in their own group versus somebody who's in the other group. Whereas a groupy person has a different utility type from own group versus other group. So the idea is that people have utility functions, but the utility function changes, right? Or there's an indicator variable which turns one utility function on and the other one off, possibly, depending on if somebody's uh, allocating income to somebody who's in their group or who's out of their group. It's like they. Um, so here is an example. We just do a cross tab. So the people on the diagonal have the same utility function type towards in-group and out-group. Okay, so these people do not change their behavior. They do not change their allocations of income. They do not change their utility function types. Many different ways of saying the same thing. 34 people are selfish, no matter whether the person's in their group or out of their group. Interestingly, 36, 36 people, and this is probably, this isn't percentage, 36 of these subjects are inequity averse, no matter whether it's in group or outward. So they're equally inequity averse, okay? And then there are four people who are dominant seeking all the time. So these people are dominant seeking. They're always out to make the other person worse off, whether that person is in their group or out of their group, doesn't matter. They just want that whoever they're facing to be, have less income, a greater distance between their income and the other, and between my, the subject's income and the other person's income, whether that other person is in or out of their group. The off diagonal are groupy. They're the ones who are switching their preferences depending on, on whether the person is in their group or out of the group. And when we do this across the entire experiment, right? So we also include the political group treatment about 35% of sub, 34 percent of subjects are strongly not groupy. That means to the entire experiment, they do not change what they do depending on the group division. Nothing, a third. So I, that's a bit of a caution about these group experiments. Of course, I mean, I've, my, I've got so much of my research is on identity and its effect on economic behavior, right? But I've got a third of people who aren't changing their behavior at all, depending on the group context. So I think that's a bit of a, you know, we should remember that. On the other hand, 17% are what we call strongly groupy. They're always changing, they, right? They're always changing. Um, I'm gonna skip this slide because, uh, well, maybe I'll, let me see. Um, okay, I'm gonna skip it. I'm not sure I have time because I wanna get to some of the other ideas I wanted to get your feedback on. So what, are the, what, what could possibly some correlates of this be? In our Duke sample, we do have some hints. Uh, we don't know what to, how much to make of it. It's a pretty small sample. It's at this, as I mentioned to you, at this you know, college uh, setting. Uh, it is that uh, it, you, uh, a, a person who is groupy, or maybe should I say it this way, a person who is not groupy is more likely to be a politically independent person than somebody who's groupy. It's also um, that a person whose parents or whose father in particular has an advanced degree is more likely to be not groupy than groupy. Now, I guess a lot of caution in all of this because uh, it's a very strange population. Uh, we've got a lot of um, master's degrees and PhDs and, and lawyers and doctors, uh, fathers um, in, our, in our setting, but it's still in effect um, and it's the stronger of them. And it could be that maybe people with higher income because if parents have higher have degrees, the family has higher income, it could be an education effect. Of course, we don't know, but it is pretty strong in our data. All right. Um, now, the, and the other thing, as, you, as I mentioned, that there weren't a lot of Republicans in our data and we wanted to get a sense of that. And we also were trying to get a sense of just simple things like personality measures. So we did something very simple on MTurk. And we just looked at the minimal group treatment. So this is a sort of a relatively much less complicated study. And we just wanted to know if somebody is, is switching utility types, and this is just in the minimal group treatment, this is all we have here, uh, does that correlate uh, with other, um, other features of the person, other, other demographics that we might know of the person? So what are the correlates of somebody who is switching their utility function, again, only in the minimal group treatment, 
between um, in-group and out-group. So we looked at individual personality measures and we looked at some demographics. Uh, we, did, we do have their uh, political party affiliation because we asked that at the end. And we also know where they live. Um, really quickly, basically personality measures aren't there. Uh, basic demographics aren't there, female, ethnicity, age, education, slightly, sorry, not sorry, education, no, but political, in, political affiliation, uh, it's coming up again, this political independence. So not group, people who don't switch their um, behavior tend to be more independent. Um, and we also see, and again, this is kind of weak, but it's maybe out there, that um, people who tended to, people who switched, who were acted more in a groupy kind of way, who were more discriminatory and changed what they were doing, depending on whether somebody was in their group or out of their group. Um, in the, if you look at the deep South, that's where we found a difference. That in, within the deep South, um, this is the one that I sort of believe a little bit more, right? That there, cause there's a big difference between the, uh, the percentage of independents who are acting not groupy than the people who were Republicans. Perhaps more interesting is that um, we did see a significant difference in this groupie. Uh, the people who weren't groupy were in, um, so the people who weren't groupy were more likely to live in counties that did not experience deindustrialization. Or we could flip that around and say in the counties uh, where there was a large share of decline in jobs from manufacturing, there were significantly likely more group, um, less not groupy people. So what's going on there? Maybe people are more attached to their place of where they live. And that sort of also translates into their behavior in the experiment. Um, it could be that they are also, because um, they didn't leave after this industrialization. It could be that they're poor. Of course, we don't know, but it's an interesting, um, how am I doing? Okay, eight minutes, good. But it's an interesting uh, possibility that either attachment to place is, in, is a correlated with um, is a cor correlated with this sort of um, discriminatory behavior that people do in these experiments, um, or perhaps overall economic dislocation um, could be associated with that. All right, third study. All right, so how do, if, if this is going on, if this is all happening, um, that we both see this in-group bias, which again has been observed in many, many experiments, um, how can we possibly change this behavior? And are there changes for these particularly groupy people who I've now, I'm now worried about, right? So again, we're going back to a world where we have minimal groups and political groups. And the treatments are now, um, in addition to the, when, when the subjects are asked to allocate income towards somebody else, in addition to the group label, uh, we also provide um, an answer to a survey question, which gives some idiosyncratic information about the other person. And um, in the categorical, um, in the humanized treatment, in addition to the group treatment, we provide this idiosyncratic information. But in the categorical treatment, in addition to the group, we provide an answer that reinforces the category. So I guess the best way to show this is in, in the next slide. <laughs> okay. So in the categorical treatment, right, um, you could either be given a, a uh, it, so this is in the, in the political setting, right? You could be given a treatment that says, I think gay marriage should be legally recognized, which would reinforce the, uh, the democratic group, right? Or in the humanized treatment, instead, the subject is given a statement like, when I was little, I wanted to be a teacher when I grew up. So it's a group treatment, it's a group treatments, but now there's another bit of information that's being given about the other person, whether the person's in your group or out of your group. Again, we, 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 we have both in-group and out-group um, counterparts. In one condition, your, the, the subject is given information which reinforces the category. And in another condition, the subject is given information which humanizes, or that's the lingo, humanizes the um, other person. And indeed we find that humanization leads to a reduction in bias, but it leads to a reduction in bias from both directions. So what I mean by that is it increases allocations to the out group, but it also decreases allocation to the in group. So this 
idiosyncratic information, again, I'm going to say kind of works at both ends. Um, we thought that, you know, we, we were very interested, our initial go idea going into this is that when you provide this idiosyncratic information, this person out there who you thought was from this other group, you provide this humanizing information, then people that the people would have a, it would weaken their sort of animosity towards somebody outside of their group, right? And we do see that because we do see increases in allocation to the out group. But interestingly, we also see a decrease in the allocation to the in-group. So now you think this person's in your group, but then you find out they wanted to be a teacher when they grew up. You sort of lose that in-group attachment. Again, as demonstrated by people's behavior, we have no idea what's going on in people's heads. We're just in, I'm just interpreting that. By people's behavior, it looks like they are less attached to somebody in their in-group. Okay. Now, what about the, um, the groupy people? Okay, so what I have here is the, um, the categorical treatment. You can clearly see that um, what, we're, what I'm showing you here is there is a huge amount of individual heterogeneity in, we're back to that favoritism measure I introduced earlier on, the, um, the money that's given to somebody who's in your group versus the money who's given to somebody out of your group. And you see some people have a very, very high level of in-group bias and some people have a very, very low level, right? But the humanized, but there's a big difference between the categorical treatment and the humanized treatment. So it almost, these people who had these extremely high levels of um, in-group bias seems to really diminish, right? When we've provided humanizing information, because this is what, this is the, the, the orange is the level of in-group bias in the humanized information. So this is individual by individual by individual, right? So, yeah, and this humanizing information, though, I'm sure there's going to be, we can have a lot of discussions about this. this is, a, again, a very pallid experiment, you know, done in a university environment and so on. And perhaps our categories aren't particularly strong on a university campus because, you know, we're all supposed to be nice to everybody and have these great nice debates and so on. We're not supposed to be, you know, these are our fellow students and overall. Uh, but we do have some evidence here that um, providing this humanizing information um, decreases this uh, group attachment, but again, in both directions, right? So uh, both from the in-group attachment, but also this out-group uh, detachment or, or bias against the out-group. Okay, so, um, no, I should, yeah, uh, maybe for the questions, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, in heterogeneity, so what do we find? There is, again, I think one of the major takeaways from all of this is that there is heterogeneity in group settings. There are groupy people out there. And maybe more importantly, there's not, I don't know which is more important. There's not groupy people out there. There are people who do not react to these group divisions in these experiments, robustly so. So this is robust finding experimental. I keep seeing it over and over again. And maybe it's actually out there historically. So go back to the, my very first slide where I had, of course, those horrific images up there. Well, even in the midst of genocide, there's people who do not act that way, right? Genocide is not perpetrated by the entire population. And we all know the, uh, the histories of different folks who actually went the other way and, and indeed saved people in those times. So this heterogeneity is really important to understand not only experimentally, but when we look back and we look at out of the world, you know, what is it that um, makes people, certain people, became, become, you know, uh, you know, act in this particularly way, but of course other people are not. And of course, there's also during these experiments, during these historical moments, there's people who simply profit off of those divisions, right? So there are people who are simply profiting and figuring out how to way, a way to make the most money that they can for themselves in the midst of this, you know, horrific uh, moment in time. Um, all right. Uh, so, we do have some sense experimental that not groupiness is correlated with real world behavior or demographics. So no political affiliation. So this is the idea here. You get somebody who thinks the same way. So like take our Democrats and our democratic leaning independents. They have the same political positions. They have the same, you know, again, we don't have informational intensity, but we have the same political positions, but some of them have decided to at least call themselves Democrats and other people don't call themselves Democrats. Well, the people who've decided to call themselves Democrats, maybe they like being in a group. And that liking being in a group is also reflected in our experiment. 
even, you know, in, in this arbitrary environment called a minimal group treatment. Uh, so no political affiliation might be correlated with not groupy behavior. Um, there's possibly regional political and economic differences and the humanizing information reduces biases again in both directions from two ends. So um, of course this raises of hope a lot of questions. So there might be a predilection towards group-based behavior out there. We wanna know what its correlates are. Uh, what are the exp experimental settings that foster groupiness and bias? And I have to say being a, a, an economic theorist, so I, I'm a, in, I do a lot of work in economic theory. What I'd also like to do is bring this back to theory and both theory and experiments combined. So if there is this groupiness trait out there, do people self-select into certain kinds of activities? If a firm puts up a different wage policy, do people self-select into the firms or jobs based on their wage policy, based as a tournament versus a you know, peace rate versus a you know, some are more based on, you know, you know, competition among teams. Do people self-select into political movements? Uh, and if this self-selection is happening, if so one, if there's this trait and people then self-select, well, of course, then we need to be concerned about the wage policies that we post because we're then going to be, then certain people are going to be showing up at my firm and I wasn't necessarily expecting it. Or maybe I was because maybe I'm a manager and actually understands this. So I, I think that understanding that if this, this in-group bias is, is, you know, people are more or less groupy, that has implications for how indeed groups form to begin with. So thank you very much. I really appreciate the chance to um, present this and, and end with these questions. And I'd really be interested in answering your questions and see if you have some directions and ideas for us. Wonderful. And I'm going Thanks to so stop much, the Rachel. chair so that we can all see each other. Which is yeah, actually, chair. I mean, okay. you might maybe want to keep your screen share oh, just so really? that you can okay. jump back and forth if there's some oh, okay. uh, about results. But so let me start. Um, uh, the behavioral economists in the audience will uh, have asked a few questions about uh, causality. So I'm going to start with those because I think they are um, interesting to address. So one question that came from Don Ross, which I also was wondering, was related to your previous experiments interpretation. Um, and what he raises is, uh, verbatim, he says, isn't there an endogeneity issue in your reasoning about the negative conclusion, right? So people who count themselves as Democrats are maybe also more likely to show, you know, predispositions towards, uh, you know, groupiness or whatnot. In a way, I mean, you choose what political affiliation you want to have. That's not exogenously, you know, varied. Uh, and so what you pick up are people who have some predisposition for one thing to then also show, show a predisposition for something else. Um, how do you feel about that? Is this? Oh, I know? think that's exactly what we're doing. I don't. I'm not making a causal statement. I'm not making a causal statement. I think we're exactly picking that up. So, so that's exactly what we're doing. So, um, I'm not sure where the causal question is coming in because I didn't make any causal arguments. I'm not saying that if you're a Democrat, then you're groupy. I'm saying if you're a Democrat. I'm saying that if you're a Democrat, you're more likely to be groupy. And if you're groupy, you're more likely to be a Democrat. But I'm not saying which causes what. And it's exactly that. It's a, it's a package, right? It's a trait that's perhaps, perhaps there's some underlying trait, which is not defined. And I haven't actually studied it precisely, but it's indicating maybe there's this underlying trait. So there's some un, unobserved heterogeneity, which is driving both behaviors, both being a Democrat and behaving in this groupy way in the experiment. Yeah, and I think I think what one could do is to think about group classifications where you are born, you know, with them, and you don't choose uh, to be in those. There's something that is exogenously varied, right? So to tease out some of those mechanisms. Um, but yeah, I feel like my my impression, at least at the beginning, was similar to to Don's. I felt there was some sort of maybe causal interpretation that was to be given, but now towards the end, and especially this slide, to clarify that there's a lot of like correlational uh, insights. Um, so, so your, your answer makes sense to me. I don't know, Don, if you have any follow-up stuff, uh, feel free to like post in the chat or well, say it up. Yeah. Well, let me just, just quickly say it. I mean, it, it, can I, one, can I one, pop the share? Because I'd love to, I'd like to see people. I have yeah. to go back to it. I will. Hi. Hi. <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, just in so I'm just, I really, it's a question about the logic of the design, you know, exact, as you said, in your conclusion, um, you, embrace the pretty sensible idea that by calling themselves Democrats, these folks were giving, were revealing a disposition to join a group. So probably groupier people. But, but then that would imply, it would seem to me, if that's, 
the, in the experimental design, what we really would like to contrast would be a control group or, well, a group in which um, people had been explicitly asked to signify their groupiness in the way your subjects at Duke did and contrast them with another group, which did not do that, right? Where you, where you get some, in, some exogenous evidence about their mm -hmm. predispositions, right? Or you look for an IV or something, right? Mm -hmm. So then you're contrasting those who were who right. self-primed, as it were, against those who didn't. Right. So what we're looking for is some independent measure of being a groupy person. So that might get into the, so this is something I've been thinking about, might get into those other scales out there. So, so I asked about a completely different context that isn't in the experiment. So actually one could be about universities. So if, if I were going to do this at a university context, it might be, some, I, I, you know, if I've got my students out there and I say, so when somebody says something really terrible about Duke basketball, how does that make you feel? And some people were like, cares. And some people are like, oh, you know, that really pains me, right? So they were getting an attachment to somehow their university, right? And then we put them in an experiment that doesn't have the university as a manipulation. So getting, so I think I completely agree, having some independent or, or, or basically it's just expanding the set of contexts where we're looking at this, you know, groupiness trait. And the idea is, well, if you're, you somehow are a person who gets very attached to your university, that's an indi indication that you're kind of a groupy kind of person and we are gonna expect you to just behave in a groupy kind of way in a completely different context, right? And so we, we actually do have that if we, just if we just looked at our minimal group treatment, right? So, and we, we do see that. So we could say, if I just ignored how people behaved in the political treatment and just looked at the minimal group treatment, I can see that as well. But we, we didn't, in the, in the end, we wanted to get a sense of how people behaved over the entire experiment. So we could have also, and we, uh, maybe in one iteration, we, could, we, we did that. I'm trying to remember. But I completely agree with the idea. And, and also I want to emphasize is that this, I don't mean to say that the not groupy people who, as, you, as I keep saying, I actually think are also super interesting, right? Is um, I'm not going to say people, the people who are not groupy in our little experiment are not groupy always, ever in every social context, right? Because each of these social contexts could be more or less salient, maybe just picked one that wasn't particularly salient for these, these particular subjects, but maybe these are the kids who are going to be crazy at a basketball game. I don't know. You know what I mean? So you have to kind of be careful about how this, you know, some, for some people, I, my argument is that there's some people who are probably not, I would, it would be great to have a scale. Like if there's an intensity of salience, right. That eventually when it's about your mother or your brother, right? And that's my tightest group you can imagine. Even our not groupy people are going to get, you know, defensive about their group. That's, so this is the, again, I'm giving you some things that we're thinking about and how we're, what we're thinking of doing. Great. So before moving to the next question, something that is along the line of what Don just said, uh, I will share with you separately. We have some ongoing work with Marie-Claire Villeval where we, we would test groupiness in a way of information selection. And sometimes you can essentially choose to learn information from in-groups and out-groups, and then we measure how this informs your behavior. But in separate experiments, we know what you want, but you don't get it, right? And so that way we sort of get at causality. Sometimes you can learn from the people you want to learn from, and sometimes you can't. And so the difference between those differences and how you learn, we can sort of tease out how in-group, out-group type of information affects subsequent behavior, right? So that's... So, so yeah. just make sure I understood that. So it's not about, it's not about an allocation of income. It's like deciding whom I'm going to listen to. Exactly, exactly. So it's the opposite, right? So you, you're not uh, affecting others, but you're deciding for yourself based on what others have done in, in other contexts, right? So oh, it's, but, I see right? what you mean. So it's the opposite direction, but it gets to the causality that Don yeah. has in mind. But anyway, so that's a separate paper. So let's focus right. on your paper. Uh, mm -hmm. There is, um, Enrique has a sort of related question, um, which is, um, Maybe do you believe that there's maybe some uh, challenge to the implementation of the results based on people trying to be consistent across these settings, right? The, the, the minimal group setting and a political setting. Uh, obviously, there's a randomization going on and whatnot, but the consistency principle would assume that people level this out. So is there any, what is your take on, on that? Well, so we could reinterpret this and say there's some people who want to be consistent and there's some people who don't. And again, I don't know, right? I, I, I don't, I, I can't tell you for sure, because all I can see is their behavior. So I'm interpreting it in terms of groups, but you're right. It could be that some people have a preference for consistency and, but they're, they're deciding to be preference. They're deciding to be consistent in a group setting, 
Right. And so can we, do we then call that groupy or not groupy? So I'm with you, right? But, we're, but it's the heterogeneity, which is interesting, right? And there are some people who emphatically are not going to be consistent. They're just not consistent. They're deciding not to be. Con- and by the way, what's also really amazing, and I was stunned, and I see it over and over again. And I guess you guys are, you know, I'm sure many of you are also doing a lot of online experiments. I've got a whole other set of online experiments. I've got a whole other set. That experiment was not online. I'm now doing a lot of online experiments, as are most of us. I'm just stunned that you can see this behavior within 10 minutes, right? So I was floored when we saw this, the, the, the you know, the, the, these 10 second choices on these matrices, they're not actually, they're not random. They, they're not making random choices, right? So when I say that I can, uh, when we categorize these individual behavior according to utility types, that's with 95 to 99% confidence. It's not like they're 50%, 51% one type and 49% another type. They're 99% that type. So it's extraordinarily consistent behavior within that, in that sense, consistent. But, that, but, then, they're, but then, then, then they're being inequality averse all the time against, for somebody in their group. But for somebody out of their group, they're selfish all the time. Again, I'm using all the time maybe too many times here. But I think you understand what I'm trying to say. Okay. Enrique, do you have a follow-up? Or, yeah, so yeah, it looks like oh, you yes. might have a follow-up. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that, the question you raised, uh, uh, Oigon, was actually a bit more uh, a conjecture about uh, uh, order effects in the, in the paper in which you compare Democrats and leaning Democrats. Because if I, if I participate in the, minimal, in the political condition first, and then whatever I do there, I... So it is an amplification, but that was a minor comment. I am more interested in the other question I raised that is about the last uh, paper. Because in the last paper, if I remember well, that paper is also within subjects. Mm-hmm. And then if I give or uh, share more in the humanization uh, condition with the in-group and less with the out-group, well, it seems to me that humanization has no effect on uh, prosociality. So I share the same, even when I get a more positive uh, message or more positive information about the others uh, from my group or from the other, they are like me. But on average, I do not give more, I do not share more. Is that correct? I think you're going to have to go through those steps again a little bit more slowly because I'm not sure I got all the connections. (laughs) Same so in, when, when, when uh, I mean, the, one of the messages in the last paper is yes. that humanization makes uh, people uh, less out. I mean, they discriminate less the out group, but they are also uh, they also exhibit uh, lower levels of in group uh, favoritism. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. So maybe what they are doing, what participants are doing in this experiment is just to redistribute. So in the humanization condition, Mm -hmm. I give less uh, to someone like me, I give more uh, to someone who is not like me, an outgroup member, but on average, I give the same. Um, I don't think that that's, I think my graph show that's not what's happening, but I'm going to, I'd have to get into, again, I'm I'm not exactly following the statistics. We can talk. We can talk later. That would be great. But but one thing, but one thing though, I want to say is, um, so maybe we're saying that the same thing, right? Is that, yes, in some sense, what, you, what the way I, I'll interpret it, you tell me if I've got your interpretation too, which is that what's this humanization is making people see the other people more as individuals. And so then there's less, they're just giving similar things to people that they view who are more alike to each other than they were otherwise. And yes, that's what we're seeing. I don't know okay, if but it would be, my point is about what is the level of, um, uh, say, prosociality in the humanization condition versus the, I don't know how you call the other one. Uh, the categorical the, one. Yes, the categorical condition, on average. So the prosociality starts to, declines in the humanized condition. Okay. Yes, it does. On average. That, that, yes, okay. exactly, on average. That was, the, that was the bar graphs I had. Maybe I went through them too quickly. And that's exactly one of the, 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 the sort of the title is something like the hidden cost, or I don't know, we went through various titles. You know, okay. they, the, you know the, 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 the problem with humanizing people is that you actually reduce the pro-sociality on average for the in-group. That's it. So that's it. That is, that's there. And so you've reduced the difference, but you've also reduced the pro-sociality for the in-group. Yes. Okay. 
Let me okay. just say in the interest of time, since we have a few questions, I okay. think where your last paper connects well to, um, there is a large literature, especially in social psychology, on the dehumanization divide. And I think that's what your results actually show, right? You, you reduce the divide. There are very recent papers that I can share with you that came out this year and, and end of last year that really show how can we reduce that gap. And I think that's actually more informative than the mean that maybe Enrique is thinking about, right? I think actually the gap between those things, as you narrow this down, that might actually be more informative. Right, right. so, so, so yeah. but again, relative to some, so I think we were also going for the dehumanization idea that, that, that makes that, you know, this other person out there who was dehumanized is now more humanized, right? Yes, yes, yes. So that was the out group, but the surprising, the surprising finding is the in group, right? Yeah. Is that this person who I was very pro-social towards, I'm now actually less, pro-social towards, to use the language um, that Enrique is introducing, than I was before. So we've humanized that person, but now I'm going to give them less. So, and I, so that's why I actually think it's a group attachment idea is also important here as well. Um, one of the things I should say is that we've tested those statements pretty carefully to make sure it wasn't introducing another group effect, right? So it wasn't like, I like Star Wars. Um, these were meant to be things that, or I like cats or dogs, you know, because there's cat people and dog people. We were really looked for um, lines that were, people did not associate with groups because then we could have some interpretation. Well, I assumed if this person was a Democrat, then they also liked lattes or something, you know? So we really wanted to make sure it was orthogonal. Um, you know, these idiosyncratic uh, statements were orthogonal to what the group designations are. Just, uh, just, just to give you a bit more of how we chose those statements. Great. Yeah. So let me conclude with the final question. It was a two-part question uh, by Becca. One, one part was related to your design, which has given how many decisions they had to make, right? And these hundreds of decisions in a way. Do you believe there was like some fatigue that, that could have happened? Do you have like any checks for, you know, attention checks and whatnot? So that's Absolutely. one part. The other part is maybe you have some intuition about how, representative these findings are? Like what kind of cultural elements have you started to pick up? I mean, you did the MTurk experiment to, to check some correlations. What kind of cultural elements do you believe could uh, impact the, the representativeness and the like, sort of validity of your results in, in other contexts? So, okay, yeah. okay, so great. So attention checks, that's also a wonderful check question. And again, I actually, so again, I'll give you an anecdote, but then I'll give you the statistics. So the anecdote is I watched people, right? Doing this stuff and they were very fast. It was 10 seconds, right? But what looked to me like they were doing, because I could see everything that they were doing on the screens, it looks like they were adopting a rule. They were just adopting sort of a rule of thumb. They were looking at each matrix. And for example, the selfish people were just, that was a really easy rule. They were simply looking for the top number for themselves, right? And we actually have time response data that the people who were doing inequality averse um, choices, where they, you know, you had to actually compare the top, or you had to compare across rows and maybe subtract took longer. So we do see in the time response data, a lot of evidence that of, again, you know, I don't want to over interpret time response data, but we see that they're taking a bit longer. We actually see that the, 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 the time it takes to make a decision actually tracks the utility, the utility of the decision. So if the choices of, of the choices, if you were to apply your utility function to the top row versus the bottom row, and you get a utility number, when those numbers are very, very close, people take longer to make the choice, which is very consistent with other evidence. So there's a lot of evidence, other evidence that when, when, the, when there's a choice to be made and the payoffs from those choices are very close, it takes longer to make the choice. So that's a lot of evidence. And we also have looked at order, you know, at the, towards the end of the experiment, it's as, as robust those assignments as in the beginning, no matter, and there's no order effect, minimal group first, political group first. So we've done all of those checks. I'm not quite sure about the cultural um, question. Of course, this is a college campus. Um, and so the robustness of it is we've now done this, you know, we did this MTurk study, you know, to the extent that MTurk is representative. Of course, the thing to do would be to do this, you know, in, uh, you know, a more representative population. I know we're all in prolific now, right? And okay, oh, here's a question for you. How many of you have joined prolific as a subject? Anybody out there? No? Okay, I did, right? Probably not the right population. Right, because I wanted to see what the, I wanted to see if I was a subject, what did it feel like, right? What, 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 what are the, sub, try it. Let me know, send me an email. 
Great. So happy, happy to hear what you think. Yes, great. So, so Rachel, thanks so much. This was exciting, enlightening. Um, thanks so much for joining everybody and staying a bit uh, over time. But these questions were too good to pass up on, and the answers, obviously, too. Um, so then, yes, thanks, everybody. We'll see you in two weeks, hopefully. Spread the word and then join us for our next uh for our next talk in two weeks. Paulius, any any concluding words? Uh no things. Right. Thank you so much for joining everyone and see you in two weeks. Great. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you everybody. This is great yeah. to see you. Yeah. Great to see you.